everybody. It's Hilton of 10.8 Performance. We're back again in the 10.8 Performance Lab. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. In this episode, we are going to talk about the Aimpoint Acro P2. Like the Volvo, it's boxy but good. Let's talk about why and what else we need to know about this thing. So a little while before filming, I posted a poll on my Instagram story and asked for your questions about the Aimpoint Acro P2. And we're going to talk about those. We're going to answer those questions today. So let's, uh, let's, let's check it out. Also appreciate you guys dropping those comments in there, um, both on the, uh, on the videos here on the YouTube and also participating in those Instagram story polls. Cause uh, just, uh, really helping to uh, get a cooperative effort on the content here. First, most common question was about the availability. I'll offer that, uh, hey, do what I did. Hit the Google and look for stock status on different resellers. I usually go to Big Tech's Outdoors for a lot of my optic stuff, but in this case, I went to the Aimpoint site and stocked it. And when they did a, a, a drop of a short quantity of uh, the, the P2s, I grabbed one. One of the questions was whether there was an issue uh, with production or if they had even spooled up full production. The answer that I get from closely placed sources is that Aimpoint is at full production, but they are fulfilling uh, law enforcement and military slash government contracts first. I don't know where specifically all the optics are going, but the contractual requirements, because a lot of the contracts that they get, they're written with a delivery time window uh, in there. So they're apparently making these as fast as they can and they're getting all absorbed. Next bunch of questions was regarding the battery life on the optics and uh, Aimpoint's website claims that it's good for 50,000 hours on an unspecified setting. The P1 only claimed 15,000 hours on a equally unspecified setting, which uh, ended up uh, being one that had to be very low. So the P1 realistically, no matter what they claimed in the brochure, I was able to get about three weeks of battery life on it. The P2 runs on a 2032 battery, which is what the pretty much everything else runs on the full size things like a uh, name point. T2, T1 series, they run on a 2032, an RMR runs on a 2032, so it's a dramatic improvement in battery capacity. And the, the P2 basically resolves the battery life issues. Next, a number of different questions regarding the weight of the optic and how it may or may not affect cycling uh, on different guns. Just to kind of uh, attack it in, in a broad scope, the Acro weighs 60 grams and the RMR weighs 34 grams. So it's almost twice as heavy as an open emitter optic. The RMR is going to be our uh, standard example for open emitter for this particular video. What this means on this particular gun, so this is a Gen 5 um, Glock 19 MOS, and I've got the P2 mounted on it and shooting 115 grain ammo that is normally, you know, on the softer end of things, obviously, for nine millimeter ammo with the Acro P2 on there, the gun feels like it's, the recoil impulse on it is very soft, almost like I have a compensator on there. It has very similar uh, feel. So uh, the weight is not transparent to the gun. Now running hotter 124 and 147 grain ammo, that extra weight on the slide is relatively transparent, but when we're right on the edge of, uh, on the lower edge rather, of available recoil impulse, then it, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, makes a difference. One of the questions specifically was whether it would work on a Staccato C2. I haven't mounted any of the aim points to my Staccatos, but I don't see why it would be an issue with full power ammo and just a unmodified uh, Staccato C2. Um, I don't see that it would be an issue. The other question was regarding mounting it to a Staccato XC or similar gun. Um, with the XC, the slide is lightened, the recoil impulse is already very low uh, in terms of the available energy that the system has because the, the heavy compensator, uh, the cone barrel, you know, the weight of the comp and the porting uh, at the end on a 
full expansion chamber compensator. Basically, you've got all the effectiveness for robbing the gun's system of recoil energy by design. And that's your benefit because the XC is an extremely soft, easy shooting gun. You add a 60 gram weight onto the slide and I think you're in for headaches because the, the XC is already in a very narrow functioning window in terms of basically it's juggling a lot of things to get you that performance where it shoots like an airsoft gun or, or BB gun or whatever. Uh, so I don't think that's a great idea. Unless you just love to monkey with springs and, and uh, do experiments ad nauseum. But if you just want to run the gun, I, I recommend a lighter weight optic. Uh, on my Glock 19 experiments, I'd run the KKM compensator with my original Aimpoint P1 Acro and with the softer 115 grain ammunition that otherwise is uneventful in that setup with an open emitter optic, uh, that gun shut down frequently. So again, the uh, weight of the, the acro definitely has an effect. Hey, stop what you're doing, get down below this screen and click like and click subscribe, ring that bell so that you get alerts for when new videos drop. Don't miss anything. Also remember please to comment below with topics that you'd like for us to discuss in future episodes of the 10-8 Performance Lab. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Next question is regarding holster fit. That kind of depends what we're doing. So if we're talking about a duty holster like this, Safari Land 6354 RDS, it fits in there with no issues. I have some earlier 6354s, uh, the non-RDS models that didn't have the hood, and those did not fit this thing. So um, it, it's a constant evolution with the Safari Land line. I did a video earlier on the Blackhawk T-Series for the Glock 19 with a TLR7A and an RMR, basically this gun. And it fits in there, of course, with the hood. Uh, this gun is now configured differently, but the short answer is that the Acro does not fit under the optic hood for this particular holster. Um, so that's a consideration. But with the Safari Land, it does fit. As far as CCW holsters, well, it's no issue. The LAS concealment holsters that I usually use uh, are cut to clear any kind of optic at top, and you can see there's plenty of room on here. So sticking the Acro on there or whatever else you might have is not an issue at all. Next question was regarding mounting. The Acro, of course, has a unique footprint, which is the same between the Acro P1 and the Acro P2. Uh, the plates that I used, uh, I originally used the factory provided or factory available uh, B&T mounting plate. I used that to good result with my P1. And then uh, more recently, uh, this particular gun here uh, has a CNH Precision Weapon Systems uh, plate on there and uh, works very well as, uh, as just as well as the factory option of the B&T plate. So I like both of those, B&T slash factory and also the, the CNH. So if you're not mounting to a Glock OMOS and you're talking about Staccato uh, 2011, which was one of the, the, the questions, uh, both CNH Precision Weapons and the Factory slash Dawson Precision, uh, who works in tandem with the Factory, uh, they both offer mounting options. Like I said, uh, if you're mounting to a full recoil impulse gun like a regular Staccato P or a regular Staccato C2, you'll be fine with the uh, the P2 atop there. I really don't recommend mounting it to uh, an XC or anything else where you're porting and, and robbing the system of energy because the, the, the weight of that optic is going to rob the system of some energy as well. Prefer not to play games with that. Next up, compatibility of backup iron sights with the Acro P2. Even though it looks like the optic sits lower because the glass in the window comes down lower, uh, the reality is that there's still an interior deck for an emitter inside at the bottom of the optic, much like you'd have an emitter on the back bottom of an open emitter optic like the RMR. With the emitter on the interior bottom of the Acro, you basically have a very similar deck height above the slide as you would with an open emitter optic, and specifically in this case, I measured it against the RMR. So sights that work for the RMR on the Glock OMOS 
system will also work on the Acro. The reality is that I basically, the, the 10 8 sites that I offer, I have one optic height for the Glock system, and it works for the RMR, the Holosun 507C, the Holosun 508T, 509T, and the Acro P1 and P2. So it works on all of them. There's slight differences in how they mount, uh, how they appear through the windows, but they're all lower one third with the same set of sights on a Glock MOS. Size, well, yeah, it, it, it's big. As we already covered, it weighs almost twice as much as the Trijicon RMR. It's larger, it's bulkier than any of the other open emitter optics that you're gonna find. Um, I do find in an appendix position carry that the, the back top corner of the optic, which obviously isn't present in an open emitter setup, uh, that corner in appendix carry, look at this, think this one through, do the math, there is a new corner that is present on this when carrying in appendix position that is not present on a gun with an open emitter. So depending on how you're built, how, you know, what clothes you wear, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it may or may not be an issue. For me, it is kind of a significant issue. It increases drastically the amount that the gun prints in uh, appendix carry. Specifically in regards to size, question came up as to how it compares to the Holosun 509T, which is also uh, an enclosed emitter design. Uh, it is bigger, I'd say, uh, just looking at them. Optic quality though on the, the aim point is significantly superior. It's extremely clear, uh, significantly superior to the 509T, which I know a lot of the samples, mine included, uh, has a little bit of fish eye. So depending how you're looking through it, um, you know, you get a little bit of visual distortion. Is it the end of the world on the, on the hollow sun? No, but if we're just talking about discussing the, the merits and the, the feature set, uh, it is, you know, hard to dispute the optical clarity and quality on the Acro. So to round up the discussion on size, if we're talking about carrying it in a duty holster, uh, which is already kind of going to be a big physical setup, you know, you got this monster on your hip, the size of the optics is going to be relatively inconsequential. I would say that it's viable choice. For CCW, you're going to have to figure that out for yourself, but it definitely uh, does make the gun some bit bigger. Window size. It is vertically taller than the RMR, for example. Uh, it is vertically taller, but narrower than the Holosun 509T. So it's kind of a unique shape. I find that the uh, additional vertical height uh, equates to a little bit of forgiveness in how the dot is acquired visually maintained or uh, be able to be referenced in recoil and also in presentation because the dot is coming in in the vertical plane when you're presenting out and uh, with a little bit of extra vertical in the window, uh, that's kind of a nice little you know, added bonus. I don't consider the width or lack thereof, whatever, uh, to be really much of an issue. Uh, so it, it is, a, is a much taller window. The window overall is definitely bigger than an RMR and uh, it is clear, like I said, it's uh, both uh, optically clear and just color-wise clear. Uh, the RMR has a little bit of the fishbowl effect and a little bit of a bluish tint, and that's uh, the bluish tint is by design. It's, it's a filter uh, for certain visual wavelengths to allow the uh, emitter to be more efficient and project that red dot to be more visible to you. So why would we pick the Acro over other enclosed emitter designs? Well. Let's just first look at its positive attributes. It has uh, excellent optical quality. Again, as we both talked about, the, the clarity and the color. Uh, it is physically robust. Got the aim point name behind it uh, as far as you know, history of physically robust optics. Uh, the battery life finally is resolved, so it is well over one year. And um, it's just well supported due to the proliferation of aimpoint optics in uh, law enforcement and military use. So if you're trying to write policy for your department, getting support for this optic will not be very difficult because, hey, it's an aimpoint. All right, so uh, that's that's going to be an attractive feature, you know, if you're writing uh, policy for adoption or approval at your department. 
Also, as far as picking other enclosed emitters, realistically, the only other options on the market are the Acro P1, which I would say is, is going to be a non-starter. It is almost physically identical to the P2. I mean, you look at them and you, you got to look hard to see which one's which. Um, if you're looking through them from behind the gun, the P1 and the P2 are very similar. There, there's no real physical difference that's going to be of note. Um, but the battery life on the P1 is just, that's, that's the deal killer. Uh, 509T, we already discussed that one. Um, it has some issues with glass quality as far as I'm concerned. Um, and some contract requirements and departments may not want to approve it because it is made offshore in a country hostile to U.S. interests. Uh, we've, we've covered this in, I did a roundup on pistol optics a uh, number of episodes back. I'll link that for you guys. But uh, if that's a factor for you, fine. If it's not, then also fine. You know, we're watching each other on devices that were made probably in China. Lastly, the only other real big player I see out on uh, enclosed emitters is the Steiner MPS, relatively new. Uh, appears promising, but I would say it's largely unproven. So uh, I'm gonna take a wait and see on the Steiner. It's also big. So let's wrap this up. Is the Acro P2 for you? And I would offer while you're trying to make the decision is don't go just with parroting stuff you hear on the internet that open emitter is going to get you killed on the street or some other nonsense like that. Think hard, think critically, think for yourself. Think in terms of what you actually need the optic for, how you're using it. Um, remember, an enclosed emitter optic still has glass on it. It's not some magic thing because it's, it's enclosed in a tube or a box shape or whatever. There's glass on either end. Um, you know, I spent the entirety of my law enforcement career using some actually almost a, an aim point on my, my uh, long guns for almost the entirety of it. I, I've tried some other optics over the years, but um, plenty of time with, with things with glass on either end and a tube, all right? It's not magic. They'll still fog. They can become fouled by the environment, mud, water droplets, rain, spilled water, whatever. It's not a magic formula for just being invincible. Neither are iron sights for that matter. They can pack with mud and debris as well. They can get shorn off uh, with impact. So there's no sighting system that's infallible. So try to get over that particular thing and understand what you're trying to, what you're trying to achieve. And as far as evaluating the optic for law enforcement duty use and the issues or perceived issues with uh, enclosed emitters versus open emitters, remember you're carrying it, even though it's exposed to the elements, you're carrying it in a holster and the holsters now come with little hoods on them. So if you get the holster with a properly designed hood on there, it really kind of eliminates any kind of real consideration as to stuff getting in or on the optic. All right, so yeah. And both of them are gonna be susceptible to fogging. You know, you're, if you get out of a very heavily air conditioned enclosed vehicle and get out into the high humidity, that we might have in Florida, fogging's still gonna be a thing. Not getting around that. I would offer that for CCW use. Uh, one of the smaller open emitter designs like the RMR and so forth are probably more compelling due to the size and weight and any lack of uh, real exposure to the environment because it's covered with your clothes, all right? And uh, that, that really eliminates most of the, the real concerns for the considerations regarding opener and closed emitter. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching another episode of the 108 Performance Lab. That was a pretty deep dive onto the Aimpoint Acro P2, the boxy unicorn that hopefully if you want one, you'll be able to score one soon on uh, some favorite retailer of your choice. If you'd like to support the channel, a bunch of different ways that you can do that. You can go to 108performance.com, you can get sights for your optic equipped pistol. You could get uh, other parts. You could get merch. There's new merch. Check this out. We got new shirts and lightweight hoodies. Look at me also being a male model. Uh, I can only turn right though, so they really limited my advancement in the field. 
if you would just help my cause, my failure as a male model, by buying one of the new shirts or lightweight hoodies, that would really help out so I could get to male model school and uh, learn how to turn left. All right, so get on those new shirts, lightweight hoodies. Also got coupon codes for all kinds of cool gear. Description below. Check those out for the different coupon codes. You can go to Big Tech's Outdoors and um, prowl their website for all the different optics that you might want and use coupon code to save uh, on whatever stuff the coupon code works on. Uh, and lastly, if you really like technical discussion stuff, Patreon. Hit my Patreon. Talk about all kinds of stuff on there. All right. That's all I got for you this time. Until next time, I'm Hilton of 10.8 Performance, and remember, only performance counts.